Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Today it's August 15th, and uh, we're going to continue today our study of uh, Isaiah, uh, looking at Isaiah chapters 31 through 33, I hope. That's my goal, at least. But before we get down there, let's talk about what happened on this date, August 15th in history. Well, first of all, it was on this date in 1534 that Catholic priest Ignatius Loyola founded the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits. Uh, the Jesuits are one of the orders of the Catholic Church, and they have uh, been around for quite, since that time. They're still around today. One of the things that the Jesuits are known for is their dedication to education. Uh, and to that end, here in the United States, they've created a network of schools, colleges, Jesuit colleges, two of which I have attended the University of Detroit Mercy and of course Loyola University of Chicago where I graduated in 2003. Um, but it, the whole thing was founded by Ignatius Loyola on this date in 1534. In 1620, the Mayflower left Southampton, England with 102 peasants uh, destined for the New World. Uh, you know, Mayflower, the Pilgrims, Thanksgiving, all of that. Well, they left on this date in 1620. In 1914, the Panama Canal opened. Uh, this was the canal that linked the Atlantic with the Pacific uh, through the Caribbean. Um, interesting, there's a couple of interesting uh, documentaries about it. One of the things that I never realized about the Panama Canal was, besides the fact that there were other locations that were competing, to become the, the Panama Canal is that I always kind of thought that it was because there was this, this you know, difference that one was higher, like the, the uh, Atlantic was higher. But in fact, what, what, you know, they're relatively equal in, in height and the Panama Canal lifts up and then comes back down. So it's just kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing to me. But I don't, I, I digress. Uh, let's see, on this date in 1939, the movie The Wizard of Oz premiered. Wizard of Oz premiere. Now, I, I get a kick out of The Wizard of Oz for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, it, it's based on a book written by a guy named L. Frank Baum. Now, by the way, for those of you, side note, for those of you who have seen Wicked, the main character, the, the Wicked Witch, is named Alphaba. L. Frank Baum, L.F.B. Alphaba. That's free. That won't be on your test. And he wrote about 14 of these stories, different stories. And, and The Wizard of Oz, actually The Wonderful Wizard of Oz is the name of the first book, it is only the first book. Okay, there's 13 others about Ozma of Oz and Rinky Tink of Oz and The Patchwork Girl of Oz and Return to Oz and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's, and, and these are stories that I have read to both of my boys. In addition, I've seen, you know, I read the, the original Wizard of Oz book, I've seen the movie, um, I've seen I've read the original book Wicked and I've seen Wicked. So I've, I've seen four different versions of essentially the same story. And what's fascinating about that is there are four different stories all dealing with the same basic set of facts, uh, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, whenever I talk about the Gospels, I usually bring out that story to kind of give an example, contradistinction sort of thing. But one of the things about the Wizard of Oz movie, some of you may remember watching it, it came out in 1939, and, it, and, and there was this an amazing moment in the film where, if you remember, the film starts out in, in Kansas when the tornado comes along, and it's all in black and white, okay? And, uh, so, you know, Dorothy gets hit on the head, you know, sleep, whatever, the tornado comes, and the house gets picked up spinning around in the air, and she sees the person with her little, trying, the teacher trying to get her dog, and, and then all of a sudden, Boom, the, the, the house lands in Oz, and when she opens the door, the movie turns to color. And I think that's one of the kind of the interesting things about the film. Uh, and certainly in 1939, it was, it was a great uh, surprise to those, to those who watched it. Um, but speaking of, of uh, colorful events, it was on this date in 1969 that was the opening day for Woodstock that uh, concert in uh, New York, Three Days of Peace, Love, and Mud, as I understand it. Um, I was not there. I was far more interested in Batman and Robin um, at that age, but uh, it did start on this date in 1969. 
Today is Napoleon's birthday, Napoleon Bonaparte, born on this date in 1769. I have been to Napoleon Bonaparte's grave. Uh, it's, you know, big, great, big, I don't know, sarcophagus? I don't know, a great big casket uh, monument that he's been in, in in Paris. We were there in, I think, 1995. But he was born in this date in 1769. Um, in 1912, Julia Child was born, the chef Julia Child, who wrote the book, The, the French Chef. And uh, I have been to Julia Child's kitchen. Uh, that is in the Smithsonian Institute. And, and in 1917, today is Oscar Romero's birthday. Oscar Romero was a Salvadoran priest who was killed in 1980, I want to say, um, by... Uh, who, who killed him? Some of the, uh, I want to say, arms dealers. Uh, that were going on uh, during that time period. Now, I have not been to Oscar Romero's house or his uh, country, El Salvador, yet, um, but I have seen the movie Romero, starring Raul Julia as Romero, which is kind of interesting when you kind of see how he uh, started to see the light as far as the uh, oppression that was going on in that day. Finally, it was on this date in 1057 that Macbeth, King of Scotland, was killed in battle by the son of Duncan. Okay, now this is the historical event upon which 500 years later, 600 years later, William Shakespeare would write a play. And I, I tell you what his play was named, but then again, I don't want to bring bad luck on it. But King Macbeth in history died on this date in 1057. Okay. Well, that's all we got for what happened on this date in history. So let's get back to talking about a couple of other historical events, the invasion by Sennacherib and some other things today as we discuss in Isaiah. So let's get back to that right now. Good morning, welcome back. Um, I assure you that it is a lot cooler in here right now than it was uh, out there uh, on the flower bestrewn deck. And so now that the temperature has dropped around me by about 20 or 30 degrees, I think we can get back to talking about Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 31 is where we're going to start today. Now, we're, we're in this section 28 through 33, this six chapter section where Isaiah is talking about this plan that the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah had uh, to rescue themselves. And that is the Lord had given them instruction and they just, you know, to wait and he would take care of it. And rather than trust what he had already told them, they had a better idea. And their better idea was to, to go to um, Egypt. And it's interesting because, and again, in, in chapter 30, we, we talked about that you have a plan, but it's not mine. It, you have these details, but you didn't ask me kind of stuff. And, and it's interesting, and I, and I want to make this point. I didn't make it last week in terms of this talking about this plan. Now, the Lord had, had specifically and probably through Isaiah explicitly told them what he, what he was going to do. Okay, so, so they were given explicit instruction or, or explicit direction as far as what was going to happen. And they chose not to believe what was explicitly given them and go somewhere else. And the, the Lord's command, to, and so when the Lord says, no, you should have waited... Okay. This is not like uh, this is not analogous to a situation where you know you need to make a decision: should I make a left turn or should I make a right turn? Uh, you know, metaphorically. Okay, um, you know if you're if you're you know metaphor. Let's just stick with that metaphorically. Okay, um, that that you need to wait for the Lord to say turn to the left, turn to the right. Okay, this is a situation where the Lord had said metaphorically go to the left, and, and the nation of Judah said, no, I think we're going to go to the right, okay? And, and the Lord said, no, you're supposed to, going to the left means, you know, waiting, just letting him do his thing, okay? So again, I, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, uh, someone of the school of thought that says that every single individual decision, um, that there is a particular perfect God's will answer for that. You know, should I wear this shirt? Should I wear that tie? Should I do this, you know? I don't I don't go to that extreme and say with there's a there's a broad spectrum of what we can do within this, within the guidelines of scripture and, and anything within that those guidelines is within God's will. Um, except when we when God has given us explicit instructions, go to the left and we say, No, I think I'm gonna to go to the right, and that's in fact 
what the nation of Israel is doing here. So today we're going to get through um, Isaiah 33 through 33. We're going to knock out three chapters. That's my goal because um, I want to do 31 through 33. Then next week I want to do 34 and 35. And then the week after that I want to do 36 through 39. Uh, and that will get us through the first major block of the book of Isaiah or first Isaiah as some of the modernists uh, refer to it. Uh, but that's my goal. Okay, so this, this passage that we're talking about, 28 through 33, okay, there, there's six chapters, and, and the six chapters have kind of a, a threefold sort of structure. The 28 and 29 talk about the folly of the leaders, okay, the, these leaders that, that you're following. Uh, and then 30 and 31 talk about the results of following the leaders. So, okay, so the first two chapters are talking about you've got bad leadership. And 30 and 31 are like, this is what's going to happen if you follow the leadership. And then 32 and 33 is, is that this is what happens when you follow God. Or this is what would have happened if you had followed God all along. Okay, and that's kind of one of the, we'll get into the, the verb tense there when we talk about 32 and 33. Okay, so in chapter 30, we had the discussion about this plan. And now in 31, we're going to expand this, this plan that the nation of Israel has. Now keep in mind, God said go to the left, and they're saying no, we're going to go to the right. Okay, because in the fa and and I understand that in the face of this existential threat that they're facing, they're like, wait a minute, we've got an army there, and and you want us to wait. And God said, yeah, that's pretty much it. And said, well, no, I got this better idea. Now when we get to thirty six and thirty nine, we're going to talk more about like some of the details, Sennacherib and all those guys. Um, but here we're just kind of dealing with the general. The general principles. So, beginning in chapter 31, beginning with verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. And yet he, that is the Lord, is wise and brings a disaster. He does not call back his words, but will rise against the house of evildoers and against the helpers of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble, and he who is helped will fall, and they will perish together. Okay, so here the, 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 the folks are, are going down to Egypt on horses, to, or, or because that's where the horses are. Okay, because they have weapons that they think are going to make a difference in this battle. Okay, now it, it, in the last chapter we talked about how how it's going to be an unmitigated disaster that one will chase five and you know one will chase, you know all of that um, but here here he's just kind of reiterating that that same point okay you trust in chariots because there are many in horsemen but do not verse one look to the holy one of israel okay um in and here here it's like you didn't even try you didn't even go through the process okay you just immediately went and said i'm going to go to egypt rather than say, look to the Lord and say, okay, what, what are we going to do here? Even though Isaiah is telling them, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. Again, go back to that, they, they just went into the dark and made their plans and came out kind of stuff here. Uh, and yet he is wise. Okay, so your wise men did, had one idea, but the Lord is wise too, and he's going to bring this destruction on you. And again, going back to the talk about Isaiah, that destruction is never the goal. Destruction is, or is never the end. Destruction is a means to an end. And judgment slash destruction is not an end. It's a means to an end. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind as we're looking through these passages. And yet he is wise. Okay, let's go to verse 3. The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh, not spirit. Okay, so I, I remember I was in a, in a church study one time, and uh, Long, many years ago, and uh, the, the the point of this particular study was was they had a chart on the board, and they were like, okay, we're going to compare Jesus and Satan, okay, and we're going to compare all these things about you know how they're alike or you know kind of stuff, and you know how they're different, and and I remember sitting there thinking about that and watching, and finally I, I you know got to the end of all of these these things, and I said, well, there's there's one big difference between these two. It's like one is God and one is not. Okay, and, and here, this is a similar idea. It's like, okay, yeah, Egypt is strong in, in their own sense, but they're not God, okay? When, you know, and their horses are flesh and not spirit, okay? 
it's kind of interesting here. Remember, you know, Paul talks in Ephesians and said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, you know, and uh, kind, of, uh, kind of an interesting tie in there. But it says, when the Lord stretches out his hand, the helper will stumble and he who is helped will fall and they will all perish together. So, you know, I think what the Lord is saying here, what Isaiah is telling them is that, you know, the Lord is going to come for Egypt too. And we know that from one of the chapters 28 through 30, or one of the chapters, what was that, 12 through 23. Um, the Lord is going to come for Egypt too. And if you're in league with them, you're going to go down with the ship. Okay. So something to, to keep in mind. Chip, verse 4. For thus the Lord said to me, as the Lord, as, as a lion or a young lion as a lion or a young lion growls over his prey and when a band of shepherds is called out against him he is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise so the lord of hosts will come down to fight on mount zion and on its hill like birds hovering so the lord of hosts will protect jerusalem he will protect and deliver it he will spare and rescue it okay so i, I think here the the question now it, we're, we're kind of looking at what the lord is going to do for judah despite judah's uh, you know uh, effort. You know, it, it's one of those kind of deals that where, you know, sometimes people go through horrific situations and and life situations, family situations, whatever, and, and as a result or at, at the end of all of these situations, they're in a very good place with the Lord. And 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 some people are, are, are want to say something like, well, you know, it all ended up well. And you think, well, Okay, yeah, it did, and I, I'm very close with the Lord now. But given a choice, if I could trade that bad life experience, would I? Most people would, especially like if it involves losing somebody. You know, oh, you lost somebody, but you're closer to the Lord. So, well, there you go. It's good. It's like, well, given a choice, and and I think here this is kind of the idea. It's like, you know, yeah, you, you, I'm going to do this eventually, but it could have been so much easier if you would have just followed me in the first place. And, and but he says, as a lion or a young lion growls over us growls over his prey. And I think the, the picture here is that here you've got a lion, king of the beast, has just killed something and is eating it, right? And then some shepherd comes up. Now normally, again, let's ignore guns and all that. Normally a shepherd is not going to be a great threat to a lion. And really the lion is just going to kind of look at it and growl. And I think that's kind of the picture. Like this is what the Lord is going to think of your attempts. It's like a shepherd trying to attack a lion who's eating his, his thing. The lion's just going to growl at him. Okay, he is not terrified by their shouting or daunted by their noise. So the Lord of Hosts will come down. Okay, like birds hovering. So the Lord of Hosts, you know, um, this is sort of if you've seen the movie The Birds, we just had this flock of birds up ahead. Up, you know that this all of a sudden whoosh, swooping down, kind of thing. I think this is just sort of a picture that the Lord is trying to give. And this is how I'm. I'm just going to swoop down and take care, like I promised I would. Then in, in verse six. It's sort of an appeal to, to the people in the midst of this. Turn to him. Turn to him, which essentially is what repentance is. Repentance is just it's a turning, right? Turn to him. From, turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. Okay? Again, kind of mentioned again in, in uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. For in that day everyone shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. Remember, we talked about this uh, similarly in, let's see, where was it? In, in Isaiah chapter 30, uh, beginning with verse 22. Then you will, uh, in that day, say, so you will defile your curved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. And here the Lord is saying, turn to him and, and get rid of these idols. Okay, trust in me and, and it'll be much better off for you in, in the long run. Uh, which your hands have sinfully made for you. But then, then verses 8 and 9 of chapter 31, you have this ultimate promise of deliverance from Assyria. And again, we're going to come back to this in 32 and 33. Again, I, for the most part, the Lord is talking about Assyria because that's the issue. We're going to Egypt to get rid of Assyria, to, to remove the, the threat of Assyria. And the Lord is saying over and over again, I'm going to take care of Assyria. And, and ultimately he does. History tells us Assyria fell. And the Assyrians shall fall by a sword, not of man, Okay. Can we be any clearer here that, that it isn't the Egyptians that are going to do it? And, and last week we talked about in chapter 30 where it said you're going to bring your money and they're just going to take it. 
and he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be put to forced labor. His rock shall pass away in terror, and his officers desert the standard in panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So, like, the heat is going to come out of Jerusalem. Is, it, is that because that's where the temple is? Perhaps. Um, that makes sense to me. Um, but, you know, he's like, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen to to them. Okay, this is this is what happens, you know. And again, we're we're in these two chapters, the result of following the leaders. And I'm moving into the next two chapters. What would have happened had you followed God? And this, and this is kind of an interesting, or, or or this is kind of the 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 question here is to say, okay, now are we looking at something that is uh, an alternative to the Egypt plan? Because 32 and 33 is like the results of following God, and so. These two chapters are they talking about what would have happened had we followed, or are they eschatological? I can't say the word eschatological. Are they something in the future that's going to happen? Uh, and I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, it kind of a, it's a both and. Okay, this is kind of a what could have been. Now, before we get into it, the the big question is looking at thirty two and thirty three is ask yourself: Is this a messianic prophecy? Okay, are we looking at that time when the Messiah? who th those of us in Protestantism, evangelicalism says is Jesus, are, are, we, are we looking at the time when this Messiah is going to come back, okay? Um, and, and going through this chapter, again, there are many points of comparison where you go, oh yeah, yeah, that, that fits. So, so this must be messianic, okay? That is, this must be referring to a long future time, not necessarily present time or near present time it isn't necessarily an individual a, a regular individual not Jesus you know someone else someone else okay and there are some who look at this and say yeah that is the, this is this is messianic there's no question about it and if you want to hold that position that's great God bless you um, it's not a hill I'm going to die in all right um, the problem is there, there are two points here just kind of in keeping with the way the way I, I want to look at these is, is that there's no clear reference in the New Testament that comes back to this passage that says, oh, this is a prophecy of Christ, or this is a prophecy of the Messiah, okay? Again, that's the best way of knowing whether something is a prophecy of the Messiah or not, okay? But um, you look, the New Testament, some New Testament writer says, oh, yeah, just like Isaiah said, blah, 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 Messiah, okay? We don't, we don't have that, okay? Second thing, there are a few differences. One of them is, you know, and, and we'll talk about, well, verse 1, 32, verse 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Okay, so where, where does this princess thing? If it's Jesus, then there aren't princes, and, or, you know, and again, we could go, is it the 12 tribes? Is it the 12 disciples? You know, at the time, would they have looked at this as messianic? Probably not, okay? And, and another another. Point, and, and this is why I kind of lean against it being messianic, that it's going to be fulfilled, because the reaction, and, and we'll see this reaction as we get into it, is, is negative. I mean, it's, there's a lot of issues that come up, whereas the messianic rule doesn't strike me as one that's going to involve a lot of, of issues. Okay, now again, I'm ignoring thousand-year reign and all that kind of stuff, but still, okay. Um, so is this messianic? And, yet, and the other thing, and just kind of a general principle, and that is that we don't want to, for lack of a better word, over Jesus the Old Testament. Okay, and what I mean by that is is against what a lot of people do when they look at the Old Testament. And I and I've talked about this before, and, and that is that they they look at the Old Testament and they say, well, you know, the Old Testament is you know, it's all about Jesus, and you just have to look and you see Jesus. And so you 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 look at these passages and you see, wait, that fits, that fits, that must be about Jesus. Well, that fits, that fits, that, fits, that must be about Jesus. Okay, maybe it is. Okay, but without any clear New Testament, we really want to look at what is this saying about, uh, you, you know, or, or what is this saying to the original readers? Okay, so we really don't want to look at. The New Testament, or the Old Testament, or, or the New Testament, for that matter. We don't want to look at these passages and say, "Look for Jesus." Okay. I mean, I, I've heard it where people talk about, you know, when you read the Old Testament, look for Jesus. Okay. No, you, you don't really want to look for Jesus in the Old Testament. I'm not saying he's not there. Okay. In, in whatever metaphorical or metaphysical form you want to talk about. 
Okay, what I say when you look at the Old Testament, you want to say, what does this passage tell me about God? And in effect, that's the same question you should ask yourself in the New Testament. Okay, when you're looking at a passage or you're looking at a story, you say, what does this tell me about God? Okay, what does this tell me about God? And because that's what it, the Bible is a book about God. And so, what does this tell me about God? And what should I do then if I know this about God? Okay, so. Um, looking into that, let, let's move on. Talking about this king who's going to, this king who's going to uh, reign in righteousness. Verse one: Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. This is kind of interesting because now suddenly this is like the opposite of what was prophesied for Isaiah in, in chapter 6. That you're going to speak, but they're not going to hear, they're, showing, they're not going to see, kind of thing. You Now suddenly they're going to see. At some point they're going to see. When the Lord comes back, when the Lord accomplishes all, suddenly all these people are going to see. The heart of the hasty will understand and know. Um, and then uh, this, the rest of this verse, these passages, is talking about what is the reaction to this righteous king? Now, could it be talking about Jesus? Yes. Yes, it could. I will grant you that it could be talking about Jesus. But I don't think we have enough in the text to, for us to just automatically say, oh, look, that's about Jesus. Because you know, maybe it's talking about Hezekiah. Maybe it's talking about Josiah. Maybe it's talking, you know, one of, one of those guys. But this reaction beginning in actually in verse in verse 3 where this is what the people are going to suddenly start saying okay or what's going to happen when this righteous king okay the fool will no more be called noble okay the fool uh, remember this discussion of the leaders of Zoan that they've become fools and now you're trusting Zoan and uh, now the fool maybe it's these leaders of Zoan who you're trusting will no longer be called noble okay uh, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. Okay, now six and seven are, are are good because it's just these are two verses that one talks about the, what a fool is, and the other one talks about what a scoundrel is. Okay, let me just read these. For the fool speaks folly, verse six. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with iniquity. To practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the cravings of the hungry unsatisfied, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. Okay, I, I think you could probably make an interesting message here talking about the fool versus the scoundrel and, or, and, and the noble person. Okay, so you have three. You've got the noble person, the scoundrel, and the fool. I think you could kind of tease this out and make an interesting story about it. But I, I think here he's just looking at the people, you know, fool, scoundrel, Okay, these guys are, are, are taking you, okay? They're, they're taking you for a ride, okay? Um, you know, it says, the fool will no more be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. I, I must confess, when I, when I first read this passage, I thought of the Mark Twain quotation that, um, that America, the U.S., where we are, that the, that the U.S. has no native criminal, criminal class except for Congress, okay? Um, again, just... It always helps to throw in a Mark Twain quotation every now and then, okay. Um, but you know, looking at the, these this thing, the, these things that these guys are doing, okay, to practice ungodliness. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with inquiry. To practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, okay. What is for you? utter error concerning the Lord? Well, this is what the Lord is about. This is what the Bible is about. This is like these false teachers here, okay. To leave the cravings of the hungry unsatisfied, okay. Not feeding the poor, that kind of that kind of thing. Okay, um, and, I, and I think they're just indicting the leadership in general of, of Israel, of Judah at the time. Uh, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. This is, you know, looking at this, this passage to deprive, you know, what does a fool do? Deprives the thirsty of drink. Many times through the Bible and in, in, in the New Testament, twice in Matthew, there's, there's references to giving somebody a drink of water. In, in, Matthew, in Matthew 10, 42, uh, Jesus is talking and says, you know, anyone who gives these little ones a cup of water in my name shall not lose his reward. And then later in Matthew 25, he talks about um, th that is the end of the Olivet Discourse, you, you know, and, and where he's separating the sheep and the goats. And, and one of the things that 
make somebody a sheep as opposed to a goat, goats are bad, sheep are good, is, is that they gave a cup of water, gave a cup of water to him in his name. So it's, you know, the, these, you know, we, we, we look at, and, and, and the point I want to make here is, you know, this very small act of just giving a cup of water is is significant. That, and, I, and I think it starts, you know, maybe someday I'm going to write a book or do a message, I don't, I don't know. You know, it starts with a cup of water. It just starts with a cup of water that, you know, compassion, helping the, helping the hurting, helping your neighbor, changing society starts with a cup of water. You just got to give a cup of water. Give a cup of water in my name. Here, okay. Um, but he who is noble plans noble things and on noble things he stands. And I think here, without getting into a long discussion of what it means to be noble, I think he's just looking at this consistency. And, and I think everybody understands noble, honorable things. Okay, God honoring things, that, that noble things he stands. Okay, beginning in verse 9, he moves into a, 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 uh, a warning to complacent women. Okay, complacent women, beginning in verse 9. Here, verses 9 through 13. Let me read the whole passage here. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In little more than a year you will shudder, you complacent women. For the grape harvest fails, the fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Strip and make yourselves bare and tie sackcloths around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for all the joyous houses in the exalted city. A reasonable question to ask yourself here is why is Isaiah picking on women? Okay, I don't know. I don't know. A um, couple of ideas. One, one is that at the time he was writing this, some sort of festival was going on. And he's looking out his window and he's seeing all of these people, you know, women that are, are celebrating this, this festival. And he's like, you, you don't realize what's coming. You don't realize what's coming. And, you know, and he's trying to warn them. Another, and I think this might be a, another idea, um, is, is that the men aren't getting the message. Okay, the men aren't getting the message, so it's like, okay, well, if I can't get the message to you this way, I'm going to try getting it to you this way. Okay, but the point is, it, it, and, and the big picture on this is like, look, you've got this, this, uh, this complacent level. You're looking at things, and things on the surface right now look okay. And, and I'm like, I'm telling you, they're not going to stay okay. They're not going to stay okay. Okay. So look at, at verse, uh, in, in beginning of verse 14, we kind of get an explanation of what, what it's going to be like at this, in this end time. For the palace is forsaken. So you're, you're having this party. Again, this is a, a theme that Isaiah has done before. You know, you guys are having a party and when you should be, you know, worried about this. Your leaders are gone. Okay, the palace is forsaken. The populous city deserted. The hill and the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild donkeys and a pasture of flock, a pasture for flocks. Okay, this picture has been, we, we've seen this picture before, that this city that used to be so powerful is going to be deserted, so much so that it just becomes a place that animals wander around. Okay, so that's one of the, you know, and, and you guys are complacent, you need to pay attention to this, because all of this is going to happen and nothing is going to change until... And we see this in verse 15, the solution. Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. Okay, so if you're looking at how does the Holy Spirit work in the Old Testament, well, here's a great passage for you. That at some point, the Spirit is going to be poured from on high by, by the Lord. And the, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Okay, so here is this... It's interesting when the spirit comes. Besides this, the spiritual effects. There's going to be a physical effect. That there's going to be, uh, you know, the, the the desert wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and a fruitful field is deemed a forest. Okay, then when when the spirit is pilled out and all of you know, these things, again, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness quietness and trust forever. So when the Spirit is poured out, you get peace, quietness, trust. Not bad, eh? Okay. My people will abide in peaceful habitations and secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Verse, verse 19. This is an odd little verse, okay, because it just sort of 
Okay. So I'm going to read 19, 20, and 21, and you'll see why it's odd. Okay, so 19 is the end of the passage where talking about the effect of righteousness and peace and quiet and all that. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation and secure dwelling and in quiet resting places. And it will hail when the forest falls down and the city will be utterly laid low. Happy are you who sow beside all waters, who set the feet of the ox and the donkey reigns free. Okay, so here suddenly, boom. You got a hailstorm that's knocking down trees, okay, and the city being laid low. So what is what is this? What is this all about? Okay, is this a verse that's inserted because it seems out of place? Well, that's always a possibility. Not very likely at this point. I think there's a couple of different ideas. Um, it could be talking about the you know the destruction, just reminding people that the destruction of Assyria is going on. Okay. Um, it, it could be talking about just the the, the uh, destruction of Israel. I, I just have to make a note here. The wrong word. So I want to so that the next time I look through this, I don't want to make this know know what mistake I made. Okay, destruction of maybe it could be talking about the the, the pride of Israel. This one that, that the Lord is going to be working on the pride of Israel, or it could it could mean that hey, when this happens. There's still going to be difficulties. Hail is going to still, force are going to be laid low. There's going to be cities falling apart, kind of stuff. Um, I, I think you know, looking at it, the second idea is, is probably the most likely. Talking about um, hail when the force falls down and the city will be utterly laid low. It's like okay, you're, you're just going to be overwhelmed with what's going on. Okay, it's like hail on a forest, kind of thing. Okay. Happy are you who sow beside all waters and let the feet of the ox and the donkey range free. Okay. Um, talking about how free you're going to be to, to, at, the, at that point that you're going to just be able to let your donkeys range free. Okay. I remember when we were in, in Haiti, um, one of the, my, my son and I went to Haiti a couple of years ago, and one of the things I remember seeing is, is that there would be water buffaloes and, and people would just bring their water buffalo and stake it to the ground in some really odd place. Just, you know, no fence, nothing. There's just a water buffalo, you know, or a cow just staked to the ground and grazing there. And it's kind of interesting. And I thought, wow, this is an interesting community that they, they trust their neighbors that nobody's going to come in and steal this because they just kind of set it right there to, to, to eat, you know, and kind of, kind of a similar idea. Okay. Now verse chapter 33 um, here, here. This is another. This is the final passage, or this final chapter of this this particular passage here, um, and and it's kind of a. Some look at it and say it's a lament. Some look at it and say it's a promise. Uh, but it's the end result of what the Lord, what what following the Lord would accomplish or could accomplish for the nation of Israel. So, okay. So verse one. Ah, you destroyer, or woe you destroyer, woe you. Okay, we don't know specifically who. Who yourself have not been destroyed. Remember the verse earlier, destroyer is going to be destroyed, traitor is going to be betray, kind of thing. Now, here he's talking to the destroyer, probably Assyria, but we don't know. Okay, oh, you destroyer who yourself have not been destroyed, you traitor whom none has betrayed, whom you, whom you have ceased to destroy, you will be destroyed. When you have finished betraying, they will betray you. So I think this is kind of God is just kind of pointing out, say, you know, hey, by the way, Assyria, are you done yet? I mean, are you are you done? You know, have you ever had one of those scenarios where somebody is just pitching a fit in front of you, if you're a kid or a boss or something, and somebody's somebody's pitching a fit for whatever reason, and, and you just like listening to it and you find, are you done? You done? Can I, you know, can I come in? And you know, maybe this is the Lord going, yeah, are you done? Because I got some business to take care of with you guys. So. Um, but here in verse 2, O Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. Okay. In, in, remember in, in Isaiah 25, 9, uh, we, well, let's see, what do we talk about here? It will be said on that day, this is Isaiah 25, it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So this idea of waiting it is significant in Isaiah. Okay, and again, we're going to, you know, the, the classic, Isaiah's greatest hit in 4031, they that wait on the Lord. Okay, but here again, is he's waited. Okay, O Lord, be gracious, we wait for you. Be our arm every morning and salvation in a time of trouble. At the tumultuous noise, peoples flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered. Okay, so 
we're here, we're waiting for you, we know what's going to happen, and your spoil is gathered as a caterpillar gathers, as locust leap it is left upon. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and treasure, and he will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. So it's like, again, this waiting suggests an, an understanding of the fear of the Lord, and running down to Egypt doesn't. Running down to Egypt doesn't doesn't show fear of the Lord. Running down to Egypt shows a contempt that we, we don't think you can handle it, so we're going to take matters into our own hands. And I say, no, your treasure is the fear of me, trusting me to, to do this. Behold, their heroes, okay, talking about Isaiah's, or I'm talking about Israel. Behold, their heroes cry in the streets, and envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways lie waste, the traveler ceases. Okay, covenants are broken, cities are despised. There is no regard for man. The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now, what happened, and and we're going to touch on this in 36 through 39, is is that Assyria comes in, and and this is one of the thoughts on this particular chapter. Assyria comes in, and and Israel pays them a lot of money to go away. Okay, paying tribute to, to go away, and that's a beautiful thing from a from a conquering army point of view. It's like you 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 know you conquer an army, you conquer a a, a an area for what you can get out of it. Okay, as I not, not having ever been a conquering general, this is my assumption on how it works. But the the uh, the, the army comes in, and then if the if the government that's there says, listen, we'll pay you a bunch of money not to attack us or not to destroy us, then it's like, well, it's a win-win because, you know, you, you're showing your dominance and you get all this money and you don't have to do any of the administrative work, okay? So on the one hand, it, it's a fairly common thing to do, but in this situation, and we find out later from other texts that they give all this money to Sennacherib and Sennacherib says, thank you very much, then he turns around to attack them anyway, Sennacherib being an Assyrian general, okay? He's going to attack them anyway, okay? And, and here it says, covenants are broken, cities are despised, okay? And Sharon is like a desert, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. And so, so this is the end result of all of this. So Egypt has failed, Sennacherib is going to attack them anyway. They're at their bottom. They're, they've reached the bottom. They can't do anything else. Verse 10, now, says the Lord, I will arise. Now I will arise. Now that you've reached the bottom, and you can't go any farther, now I'm going to show you what I can do. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff, talking to the probably talking to the destroyer. You conceive chaff. You give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you, and the peoples will be uh, as if burned to lime, and like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Okay, verse 13. Hear you who are far off what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. Okay, so again, everyone's going to hear about this. Okay, now you guys finally hit the bottom. Lord, let him go to the bottom. And then the Lord says, okay, now it's my turn. Can I step in here now? The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? You know, again, remember the, the, the Messiah song, for he is like a refining fire, consuming fire. Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Okay, so... The, the sinners; these are the people that didn't trust him. That, that that did not. That maybe maybe these leaders, these fools, these these scoundrels that said, "No, let's go to Egypt." Now suddenly they're like, "Who can deal with this?" And and he gives an answer: "Who can deal with this? Who can? Who among us can dwell with the consuming? Who can dwell?" Well, here he gives several points. Verse fifteen: He who walks uprightly and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking at evil. He will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of the rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Okay, so again, these people whose mind is stayed on thee. Okay, get my King James slipping out here. Okay. That's the person who's going to be able to handle this. Verse 17, your eyes, whose eyes? The original readers, nation of Israel, nation of Judah, probably. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. 
you they will see a land maybe the original readers the, or you know the or the long term your eyes they will see a land that stretches afar your heart will muse on the terror where is he who counted where is he who weighed the tribute where is he who counted the towers you will see no more the insolent people the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend remember the people that are going to come and teach you the lesson in a language you don't understand they're going to be gone stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand behold zion the city of our appointed feasts your eyes will see jerusalem an untroubled habitation an immovable tent whose stakes will never be plucked up kind of talking about this permanent dwelling here is this talking about the recreation of the temple or is it messianic okay no, it could be both but there the lord and majesty will be for us a will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams where no galley with oars can go nor majestic ship can pass for the Lord is our judge the Lord is our lawgiver the Lord is our king he will save us okay remember the question that we've been asking throughout this thing who are you going to trust now here he's getting explicit okay you guys have reached rock bottom Sennacherib is about to invade you're about to be destroyed finally you realize hey Maybe we should trust the Lord, okay? For the Lord, you know, and it says, Your eyes will behold the king. Okay. For, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. So your eyes will see the Lord. Now, that to me is got a real clear messianic because, again, seeing the Lord, that's a whole other question. But uh, maybe it's just that in the action, in the in the miracle that's going to take place with, against Sennacherib's army, we'll talk about that when we get to 36 to 39, you're going to see the Lord work. Maybe that's what he's talking about here. Okay, The Lord is our king. He will save us. Not Egypt, not giving money to Assyria, not giving money to anyone else. The Lord is going to save you. Okay, Who are you going to trust? Right here. The Lord is going to save us. Verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 23, kind of getting back to the current situation because he's like, this is what's going to happen. But your cords, verse 23, your cords hang loose. They cannot hold the mass firm in its place or keep the sail spread out. This is, I think, his way of saying, you're falling apart. Then pray and spoil in abundance. Then pray and spoil in abundance will be divided. Even the lame will take the prey. And no inhabitant will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Now, the interesting thing here in the final thought for the day is that the end result here, the end picture, the end image that the Lord wants to, you know, through Isaiah wants to give us is that forgiveness is, is the goal. Forgiveness and restoration and all that comes with that. Forgiveness is, is the goal. So, okay. Well, it was a bad idea to go to Egypt. It didn't work out. And, and again, we're going to have to wait a week to so that we can get into the details, some of the details of how that uh, all went down. But we will next week, or in two weeks, I guess. So next week, we're going to talk about uh, Isaiah 34 and 35, Judgment on the Nations. Uh, and then 36 through 39, we'll get into the story of uh, Hezekiah. We'll get into a, a pretty fairly long narrative section. And I hope to knock that one off in in a day as well so thank you very much i appreciate your being with me and uh, any questions let me know otherwise i will see you again next week which is going to be what the 22nd yeah 22nd so thank you very much see you then